You want a piece of me, boy? Nuclear launch detected. Hello everybody and welcome to the official kickoff of the StarCraft 2 Nation War Season 4 brought to you by O-Gaming and Blizzard Entertainment. I'm Kevin the Coil, also known as Rotterdam. With me is my main man Funka and we are so excited to be bringing you guys the qualifiers of Nation War Season 4. Funka, we're starting with 32 nations today but at the end of the day only 16 remain. Oh yeah, it's going to be a hell of a day. 16 nations will go out after those games from today. We had 32 nations which mm. makes it already the biggest nation wars ever in terms of uh, participation and because we have all those teams we need to take out 16 of them so we can do a group stage afterwards. So it's going to be a really really sick day I think. Yeah, I think the, the build up has been very nice so far for nation war season 4. More votes than ever have been casted. I think a lot of the players were probably watching Nation Wars last year and they're like, man, that sounds really cool. I want to be part of it. Unfortunately, Shawnee is not with us this year, but there are plenty of other casters that will join us. Zombie Grub will be casting many games today. Of course, as soon as we uh, went over the Christmas break and we kick off the bracket stage, I believe, that's when Yon Merlo is going to join us. Exactly. So that's going to be a lot of fun as well. And there's a good chance we have a couple of the local French pro gamers joining us for a couple of games here and there as well. So I am excited. Let's take a look at some of the matches or perhaps all of the matches that we will be bringing you guys today on the mainstream. There is a B stream as well. That one can be found at twitch.tv slash gauntlet sc2. But Fanka, we are of course here on stream A. Talk to us about the games. Of course, so stream A is going to be showing you the best games for today. I hope Norway versus New Zealand is going to be our first match. Then we'll have South Korea who's going to take on Croatia. So really, really hard games for uh, the Croatian players, obviously, <laughs> because South Korea made it to the second place place of Nation Wall Street after losing to, you know, pretty pretty heavy 5-0 brought to you by Marine Lord and France. Ukraine versus Russia is going to be a third game. Brazil versus Denmark. Then France is going to come in with, uh, with the game against Vietnam. And probably one of the toughest games of today, yeah. USA versus United Kingdom. Yeah, I think that one is very hard to call. So I think it's safe to say we saved the best for, uh, the best for last on the mainstream. Mm -hmm. I'm also very excited to see Ukraine versus Russia. I mean, that's just a very cool rivalry to see those two nations go up against each other. Brazil versus Denmark is kind of a wild card, right? Like, how often do you see Brazilian players go up against Danish players? Honestly, not that often. Of course, on the B stream, a couple of great games. Netherlands versus Czech Republic will not be happening because the Czech Republic looked at the lineup of the Netherlands and said, <laughs> well, we're done here, you know. There's absolutely no way we have a chance against those boys. So oh, yeah. they decided uh, that they couldn't make it today, which makes sense. Taiwan versus Japan, that's of course going to be fun yeah I, I, it has to be a lot of fun it right? has to be a lot of fun nice fun already by Roddy China versus Italy coming up so I'm really happy to uh, see Rainer playing against yeah. uh, playing again sorry and uh, China last year was actually super hyped about Nation Wars the Chinese stream just went crazy in terms of numbers so <laughs> they are really really behind their players so it's going to be a cool thing uh, cool thing to see it's going to be happening on stream B so if you want to watch it in English Gauntlet SC2 is the place to go Poland versus Bulgaria once again sad for Bulgaria Bulgarian players because Poland has an amazing lineup this year. Germany versus Switzerland, kind of the same idea. Germany, probably one of the top nations here in Nation Wars 4. And then ending up with Canada versus Portugal. And I don't know anything about those Portuguese players. Really happy that they have a team and then uh, uh, they can maybe make something happen against Canada and Scarlet. We've got so many games today here in the round of 32 that a couple of the matches will not be broadcasted. But here on the mainstream, we have at least six best of sevens. And if somehow we finish early, there is a chance that we'll even do a little more than that. Other yeah. than that, guys, the show today is going to be very straightforward. As you guys can see, there is an insane amount of StarCraft ahead of us. So today is not the type of day that we're going to, you know, buy a lot of time, play some videos mm. and clown around a little bit. Like, no, we want to get into the games. All the other nations as well, we gave them a rough estimate about when they are supposed to play. So we're going to try to keep to the schedule. So I'd say we shouldn't waste too much more time and probably get ready for our very first match, oh, yeah. which is between Norway and New Zealand, which is a fun one. I mean, a lot of people look at it and be like, well, Norway's going to take it, right? I mean, Norway's yeah. got snoot. Yeah, that's pretty... Uh, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with looking at it like that. But New Zealand, I think, when it comes to the depth of the roster, is actually not that bad. Those guys are good players. Uh, we can take a look at the maps yeah. as well. Is it's this the starting map? Yeah, for it's, our the starting map. it's the starting map for our first game between uh, Norway and New Zealand. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're going to be starting in Vani Research Station. And I believe it's going to be uh, for TVZ. Well, obviously, there's always going to be 
a Zerg player for New Zealand because today we've got Petraeus, Mighty Kiwi, and Crimson mm -hmm. who's going to be playing for uh, New Zealand. So obviously all Zergs player. And at the, uh, at the opposite uh, side, we've got Norway with Sight for the first game. So TVZ on Vani will be our first game, official first game of Nation Wars 4 camp. And I'm super excited about that, obviously, because uh, that's such a great tournament, such a great moment. We have you here in Paris. Zombie Grub is with us. And that first game is already on the way. Yep. Can't believe. Like we said, no time to waste today, guys. There is so much StarCraft ahead of us that we shouldn't waste too much time. If you guys are wondering who is observing when Fonka is standing there, we brought over a very special observer all the way from Germany. He observed Home Story Cup 14, and we thought he did such an amazing job that we wanted him here. Either way, Fonka, to you all as right. the hometown hero. The honors. I'll be, I'll be doing no, no worries. In the bottom of the map on Vani Research Station is the turn player for no way. His name is Sight. It's very cool, of course, for these guys to uh, have a chance to not only represent the nation, but also play on a highly profiled match. At least one, maybe mean something for the nation and then potentially have more good matches after this. In the top of the map as the Zerg player playing for New Zealand, it's going to be Crimson. So ZVT series, every single game is going to be played on a best of seven all kill format. Basically, if you win a game, you stay in. You stay in and you play a second game against a different player. And uh, in that case, we'll see who's going to be the first one to be able to do like probably a double kill. We'll see, uh, we'll see who that guy is going to be. Is it going to be side? Is it going to be crimson? Best of seven, but there's only three players in the team, you, will, you, you could say. But there's going to be a revive. When a team run, runs out of player, you can revive one of them as the ace player who's going to be trying to uh, get the series going for his team. Which of course gives a lot of potential for one player to carry a nation to some degree. Exactly. Some people are not the biggest fan of that, but the other people love it because that truly gives a, an opportunity for people to shine. I mean, you look at the last match of today, you know, USA versus England. I think that's going to be sick. We could potentially see Neep two times. If you guys wonder, well, who's going to beat Neep from the UK? Well, what about the Muslim? The Muslim has been great lately qualified for the WSG Global Finals yesterday. He's made his debut in the Wadi Team League. Oh, yeah. All killed Root, so that's going to be a great match. But for now, of course, all eyes on uh, New Zealand versus Norway. Last but not least, Fonka, the only thing that I did not explain yes. is the, the way that we got to these matches. For some people, wonder like, wow, well, you know, why does, uh, why does the Netherlands have a potential easy opponent? Or mm -hmm. why did Poland have an easy opponent? The seeding has been done by WCS points. So mm -hmm. we looked at all the players and took a look at the amount of WCS points the players have, uh, you know, gathered over the year. Mm -hmm. And that's the, what the seeding was based upon. So obviously a country like Norway will be seeded relatively high because of you've got Snoot who collected a lot of WCS points. Yeah, we, we just uh, thought of a way to make it fair for every nation to be represented at the, the actual level that they, uh, that they showed throughout the year. And uh, the WCS standings were uh, obviously the fairest way of making it happen. So this first game is on the way for now. We've, uh, we've had like a Reaper opening from Sight who's going to add, uh, add on some Hellions and go quickly into the Stim. So no Benchy play yet. The Tech Lab has been used on the Barracks to uh, give that Stim a little bit uh, heads up because uh, as you know, it's a really, really long upgrade that you want to gather. And a third CC that has already been scout by a Zerg player. Mm -hmm. Last but not least, guys, I know there are some minor technical difficulties right now with the sound. We decided to hire the NHL sound guy as well because he's been out of work for a little while and <laughs> just felt sad. I mean, if you bring Roddy, you're going to bring the NASL sound guy too. But I believe we will fire him after the first game. For game number two, the sound should be fixed. Yeah, we, we want you to feel okay. You know, we, we want you to feel uh, to feel at home. So we uh, we hired an NASL sound guy. We'll, we'll try to make it happen after that. Uh, we promise. So those four, those four aliens are going to be poking in. See that the third hatch is on the way, getting a pretty uh, cute creep tumor right there. So just uh, avoiding the creep to be out of control too fast. Second creep tumor gets out and those queens, they keep bumping because that Reaper control from side is actually pretty nice. Yeah, so far very passive play, right, from both sides. We don't see the Zerg make a ridiculous amount of units. He made a couple of links here and there, mm -hmm. but no massive overcommitment. And on the other end, we know that Crimson is playing a very economic opening, not taking any crazy risks yet with his Hellions and with that Reaper. So I like where this is going. Both players, you know, they don't want to roll the dice here in the first game of Nation War Season mm -hmm. 4. 
they are apparently confident that they can at least get one point on the board for the nation. So macro it is. Yeah, macro it is. Nobody uh, is taking a chance while by doing by going for a weird build or a weird all-in. Every uh, both players are going to go for that macro play as you mentioned. And uh, the, the easiest uh, say, thing, sorry to uh, to see about that is like that double Evo at that double eBay. Like this is. Uh, as macro as you can get, you want to have like double upgrade, you want to have Ooh, something to make it better at the next uh, stage of the game. Those Zerglings, they're going to be poking in that third base. Will he raise the depot? He will. Losing a Marine in the uh, in the process, but not getting all the Zerglings in the main. That would have been really, really bad. Yeah, I would have said that was just in time. Now, I have to admit, there were quite a few Marines left behind, so I don't think that would have been the end of the world, but it's still annoying, especially if these links would ignore the Marines and run into the natural. Uh, good job there by Scythe being able to sneak a couple of links to the other side of the map also takes away a little bit of the pressure of those Hellions force those Hellions to come back and now the Queens can just do their duty which is not only inject but obviously spread some creep as well oh yeah obviously on a map like this really really flat the creep is super important we've seen a cancel on the second bailing nest which is kind of good for crimson you don't <laughs> want to waste any resources because it's not like there is two upgrades in that building there's only one so the second bailing nest is not useful at all that first push is going to come 16 marines two medivacs the stim is ready to Thanks. go four aliens and a run by maybe yep. on the third base Quite no, no, not no damage yet. Uh, just a couple of zerglings that managed to sneak in the natural. I would love to see him send those two links to the top side of his natural, maybe morph them into bane links. Ah. His bane nest is done, but he's just gonna go for the SCVs for now. Didn't really get that much damage done, but he's hiding a couple of bane links on the left side. These All bane right. should be able to connect with these marines and SCVs. Well done, eight Ooh. SCVs going down. Op uh, solid opening there for Scythe. Yeah, super, super great opening on this one. 52 SCVs now for the Terran player. So uh, in the in the economy side of things is a little bit behind in that matter. Those four queens are actually going to push back those 16 marines and hellbat and obviously uh, going to go, go for more creep tumors instantly. The steam is coming in and the queens have to go back and those four new creep tumors are going to go down. But no fourth base yet. A fourth hatchery rather. It's going to be a macro hatchery in the main. Yeah, The creep is helping out quite a bit though. It's just oh, yeah. buying a lot of time. Bailing speed is about to finish up. I like the way that Scythe is playing here. Once again it's going to go for the counter. Got to be careful with his own bailings of course. Don't want to sacrifices all of them uh, but he didn't lose that many and let's see if these links are going to be able to achieve something quite a few marines left behind this time so nope Good shot down there by yeah. Uh, Crimson. Yeah, great, great play, uh, great play by Sight. Sorry, on, Sight. Uh, great play by Sight on this one. Just having his uh, reinforcement, just not gonna go on the map, but uh, rather gathering on the third base. So the, uh, the you know the counter attack play from uh, from Crimson not paying off yet. Some mutilisks are gonna be in the, the production tab at the moment. Three, uh, three of them, and the two two upgrades for Zerglings when the Terran is actually a little bit ahead on this regard, like probably 40 seconds ahead on the two two timing. Is he on that side of? the map well, yes and for now micro from side is actually pretty pristine yeah crimson's got to be a little bit careful right because he's had a high drone count but he's only on three hatcheries he's been throwing away quite a few units here and there yes he does have those two two upgrades on the way for those links and banes but other than that he's been bleeding out quite a few units and without a fort base you've got to be very careful the first mutas are out but he's not in a position where he can send those mutas across the map because then he takes the risk of dying so i kind of like the way that our norwegian terran has played this so far really didn't make a lot of mistakes at all, kept the pressure on and just didn't take much damage other than those eight SCVs. Yeah, I agree. He's uh, playing a pretty good game right now. He feels super comfortable just going into the map, just, uh, you know, uh, removing a little bit of that creep. He's actually going to gather up with all his army and, uh, you know, just going to go for a 2-2 timing, which makes a lot of sense. Those upgrades are going to line up perfectly with a huge army supply, 102 for the Terran player against the 69 of a Zerg player on Muta Bailing, uh, Muta Link Bailing Tech, which is not that great for our, uh, for our New Zealand player because there's not that much creep around that fourth base is going to be so hard yep. to, to, to uh, keep it alive. Quite a few Widow Mines in the mix as well, so he's got to be careful with these Banes too. A couple of Banes get picked off before the fight even starts. His Terran army looks big. These connections are going to have to be massive. Yeah, and those Banelings are crashing through the Marines, but the split was super nice from sight, and that fourth base is going to go down for sure. That uh, counter-attack once again not achieving anything, and he's just bleeding units left and right. Going to lose the fourth archery. Gonna, not even going to get a cancel out of it. It's going to be a pure 
purely destroyed hatchery and those mutilists, they can't fight head on against those uh, numbers of marines. Mm, he's gonna try to retake his fort here, but things are starting to look a little bit dicey for New Zealand in game number one. As Sive is gonna throw down his fort CC and he has still nothing but marines. Marauders, couple of widow mines as well, running across the map. These mains, oh, all oh, widow mines actually getting a decent connection there, but I think the marine count is just a little too high. More units coming in as well. And it seems like it's going to be all Norway here in game number one. Oh yeah, Roddy, that first game is going to go uh, Norway's way for sure. Those Mutal is getting shredded by those 2-2 Marines. Scan on the creep to avoid maybe a bailing trap that could be the only way for Crimson to get back into this game. But the macro from site was just a little bit too much. He can, uh, he can actually get those uh, bad connections on bailings. It doesn't matter. He has too much. GG! Site is going to be the first winner in Nation Wars 4 getting the victory for no way. Yeah, very solid performance by our Norwegian Terran. There's yeah. honestly not that much that we can say about it. Mm -hmm. He went for a very strong economic opening, but he still had some map presence with the Hellions and Reapers. Always left a couple of units behind. Pretty much never took any damage of these Ling runbys. We saw yeah. Crimson having multiple attempts early on where he did sneak Lings to the other side of the map, but he just didn't really get anything done. And it slowed down his own creep spread and stuff. Uh, one time the Hellions did come back and he was able to push it out a little bit further, yeah. but it was just not what he was looking for. Mm -hmm. And by the time that the very first big fight, the big head-on engagement started, Terran was up 30 army supply, exactly. and that's a little too much. That's a little bit too much to, uh, to handle, especially when you play that mewling bailing style. Like you're behind on upgrades, you're behind on army supply. That's something really, really hard to uh, deal with, especially when you're about to fight out of creep because we mentioned that the creep tumors were getting sniped at the beginning of the game. Mm -hmm. This makes a whole lot of difference in the TVZ matchup. It's all about the creep, I would say. When you play bio and mines against Mewling Bane, the creep is pivotal in winning as a Zerg player. So being being uh, behind on upgrades, being uh, behind on the army supply, just was a little bit too much. Side goes for triple CC, double eBay, the most standard yeah. opening of them all. Innovation showed us the way two years ago, and we still go with the machine build because it works perfectly fine. He did it super well. He's not very happy when you call him a machine. Yeah, he's not. No. You, you think he really has feelings? He, he saw. He 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 can see why, but he doesn't like it. Oh, yeah, I've seen the interview, yeah, actually. It's a yeah, great yeah. interview with uh, Innovation. You guys should check it out on Team Liquid. Now, the good news for New Zealand is that their team is full of Zerg players, so mm -hmm. they got at least a little bit of an idea of how Site likes to play. Yep. And I also think it's safe to say that the other two players on the team are slightly bigger names than Crimson. Mm -hmm. I have seen Crimson before, and I know that he's absolutely no pushover, but I do think that Mighty Kiwi is a little bit more established. You know, once upon a time, was with Root as well, played a lot of clan matches back then, and he's been a, and like, how do you say that, like a strong presence on the North American mm -hmm. server for a long time and of course the big name is Petraeus uh, now I'm not sure if they're going to send out Petraeus immediately and of course we all know that Petraeus retired a while ago it's going to be Mighty Kiwi Mighty right. Kiwi Okay, yeah, I think it's a really, really good pickup. Like as you mentioned, we don't really know where Petraeus is yeah, in terms he's still of skills. Good. Like that guy is he still was, good. It was just like amazing. Yeah. At the end of Out of Swam, he mm. was one of the Zerg player that I was looking forward the most yep. in Legacy of the Void. Obviously, didn't show that kind of form in Legacy of the Void, but he's still a player to be reckoned with. Like he's got an amazing yeah. macro, and he's got a really great understanding of the late game for Zerg. Like he was the the, the kind of guy that would go Viper, Infester, Queens. Broodlord, controlling all those yep. armies. Like really uh, micro intensive armies. He was really good with it. Yeah. But for now, just going to go with Mighty Kiwi. Just, you know, pave the way maybe for Petraeus to finish the work after that. But Sight, as you mentioned, clearly not a pushover. Yeah, I'd like to see how he goes up against Mighty Kiwi, though. Mm -hmm. I think the second match is going to be a, a very good test for him. And obviously, it would be nice for Snoot if he doesn't have to worry about a Mighty Kiwi either. Because, of course, if you put Snoot up against Mighty Kiwi, then Snoot is the overwhelming favorite. But at the end of the day, people will always say it's ZVZ, ZVZ. and weird things can happen. And Mighty Kiwi mm -hmm. is good enough to steal a map, you know, in the best of five. I'd obviously exactly. always put my money on Snoot. But they, you know, these players, they are good enough to steal a map here and there. And obviously, if you're Norway, this is a single elimination qualifier. So if you lose this match, you're done, you're out, your Nation War Season 4 is over. Yeah. So you don't really want to take any risks. So you know, if Sight can get another point here for Norway, that would be great. Exactly. And considering historically that uh, Norway has always been mm -hmm. one of the best nations in Nation Wars, just winning Season 1, winning Season 2, even with the live finals in Paris with Aiki, Old King, 
feeling with the entire crowd chanting yeah. his name. I'm probably sure that's uh, one of his, uh, his greatest day in his life. And it was, uh, it was just an amazing feeling. So Norway has a lot to, uh, you know, a lot to work for. They are uh, favorites in those nationwide. Maybe, the be maybe not the best team they ever had, considering there's a lot of retired players. Mm -hmm. Ike is not in the picture anymore. Targa. Uh, Targa is not here anymore. But Snoot is still, is still the guy to work for. All okay. right, I believe the second map is going to be played on Whirlwind. I think it's safe to say that a lot of Zerg players like this, especially if you're able to get cross-map. You know, that's where things become really quite pleasant because it's just hard for Terran to reinforce any sort of position, right? If you mm -hmm. just want to put your rally to the other side of the map, well, there are about 74 points where the Zerg player can intercept your reinforcements and pick them off one by one. Obviously, there's a white ramp as well, so that can be annoying. Got to be on the money with your supply depot raise and all mm -hmm. So this makes sense. I think vertical is probably best for Terran. Oh, I mean, yeah. you as a Terran player, you can... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. You, you want to have... Anything except the cross uh, mm -hmm. the, the cross map situation, which is super hard to uh, work with. I remember like Scarlet used to be so good on this map back in Heart of the Swarm, going for that you know muddling bailing composition, but going mm -hmm. straight for a fourth base. And the thing is, as a Terran player, it is really really hard to pressure somebody that is so far away. So obviously, you want vertical, you want horizontal, you want something that you could put pressure on the Zerg, or you could go maybe for a mech build because we see that now in TVZ you can play mech again, and that's something that innovation. Once again, we, we mentioned him, yeah. the machine uh, could go for, because you can camp, you can, you know, make the game go a little bit longer as a mech player, but when you play bio, you want to go for timings. You want to attack straight into your opponent's face, and that's something you can't do in cross positions. In all honesty, I'm still a little bit bleeding about that game five between Dark and Innovation. Of oh. course, if you guys are diehard Starcraft but fans, you knew that the Intox Supreme Masters Gyeonggi just finished up. We were both there, and it was a fantastic series between Innovation and Dark. And then game number five, well, it ended before it truly began, and that was yeah. kind of sad. It was uh, conveniently uh, called a bop. It was a bop from Dark that didn't anticipate the pressure from Innovation, even though it was the same build five games in a row. But <laughs> this is not the game we're talking about here, and Kevin is just you know eager to introduce those players. So in the bottom right, for Norway, once again, he took game one, is one up overhead against New Zealand, that's sight. Of course, Kevin, our dedicated observer. I mean, he's had a trauma from Home Story Cup. All he wants to do was introduce the players, and then he had in control going on a four minute rant. In control is about, the worst. About how stupid it is. And Kevin is like, well, this is my first tournament, you know? What should I do? Should I still spin the camera or not? If you want to spin the camera, Kev, you can go ahead and spin the camera. <laughs> As over here on the right top side, we're looking at the main base of the second Zerg representing New Zealand. It is Mighty Kiwi. So we've got vertical spawns, which is kind of kind of good for sight, as we mentioned just before. Huge map, you want to avoid the situation where you're too far away from your opponent to put pressure on him. So, I guess already luck is on uh, sight side on the on whirlwind here, and he's actually going to go for a CC first, which is a great opening, obviously for an economical uh, standpoint. You're going to have a lot of STVs. You'll be able to power up way more in the mid game. So that's a, that's a funny thing about CC first. When you do when you think about it, early early game super vulnerable. But then, like after five six minutes, when you actually get a lot of STVs going on, you have more units. And in the mid game, like strong timing push in the mid game are actually going to be a little bit worse against somebody that did the CC first because he's going to have that much units. It's the exact same spawning positions as Dark vs. Innovation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, let's see how this one plays out. Mighty Kiwi, uh, what I can tell you about him is that in general I think he's a pretty aggressive player. He's definitely a player that I wouldn't say, you know, it's 24 drones and he goes for an all-in. He's a player that likes to go up to three bases, likes to get some upgrades, but he will cut drones before the majority of the Zergs would cut drones just to get a few extra units out and try to make plays happen. You know, I always enjoy casting games of players like him mm -hmm. because he's very active with units out on the map, yeah. tries to make something happen, puts himself in a position where he really needs to get some value or some return of investment of the units he produces. But in general, he's pretty good in finding those openings. So he's not that uh, super common, just uh, reactive Zerg. That's no. what you mean. He's going to be building some units in the mid game and try to make stuff happen with them. So we've seen that side was also super diligent in getting this, uh, his units uh, in the right place to defend those uh, to defend those counter attacks so i'm guessing side could be uh, could, uh, could be doing well especially considering the cc first that he went for against mighty kiwi but let's 
just, let's just not get carried away because this game is not started yet. Every player right now, both players are going for the macro builds, going for that third archery for my Tikiwi on the natural third base. Obviously not going to be building it to the southern side because he doesn't want to be that close to the Terran player. And Sight scouting the, uh, the wrong positions is going to know about the positioning of Mighty Kiwi fairly late. Wow, that's a super fast RTC again, by the way. Three Whoa. minutes and 20 seconds. Uh, uh, I agree with everything that you said, but there was... Um, you know, I also think that Mighty Kiwi has been watching the last game, mm -hmm. and I think Sight played great, but there were multiple moments where Crimson was able to sneak links to the other side of the maps, right? Mm -hmm. What if instead of sending them all the way to the other side of the maps, he would have just put them behind the Hellions, and he would have gone for the surround. It ah, would have given him so much more map control, and once again, that's obviously a game that Mighty Kiwi saw. So if Sight wants to do the exact same thing, there's a good chance that Mighty Kiwi, instead of running these links into the natural, he's gonna go for the wraparound, and if you shut down the first four or five Hellions, then suddenly, as a Terran player, you know, the map looks very grim. You have no map presence mm -hmm. at all. It's going to be a little harder to go Roddy. up to fly out that third CC. You know, there we go already, right? Ooh, I'm actually considering, like, seeing some Banelings getting mm -hmm. morphed because he's got a super early Baneling nest and he's making nothing but Zerglings at the moment. And that would be a great strategy against that super early third CC that oh. side is going for. And all those Banelings are getting morphed in. He's going to go for the Bane bust. I don't Hell know yes. that side can defend this. The alien doesn't see it. I think he he could if these Hellions would be able to get a couple of shots of immediately, yeah. but Scythe right now has absolutely no idea that's happening. Whoa. Dropping the mules as well. Here come these Banelings. Hello! Lots of Banelings crashing through. That bunker is already out. And those Hellions, can he get the surround? If he gets it, that's so good. Gonna go into the main, bursting the door on the main base. Maybe get the reactor. Those Zerglings getting a lot of SCVs, a lot of work done. And those Hellions, they're just coming now. He's been, he's, he's been AFK on this one. No, he sent the Hellions into the third base, which oh. I thought was a very surprising choice. Maybe he was lost a little bit, maybe he was focused on defending. He's taking a lot of damage, of course, with three Cs. Any sort of comeback is possible, but he needs to keep the Hellions alive. And this is not the way to do it. All the Hellions will get picked off. And I believe that Mighty Kiwi is going to even things up here for New Zealand. Oh yeah, no, no, no questions asked. That's going to be a 1-1, one, one, no problem. All the SCVs getting demolished. Those Zerglings, a lot of work done with those Zerglings and Banelings. And you just punish that kind of uh, that kind of Terran player. Like you can't go for that triple CC, double eBay out of a CC first. And the micro, as you mentioned, yes. wasn't there from sight. And that's going to be a GG. Mighty Kiwi evens it out for New Zealand. Yeah, Mighty Kiwi doing what he does best. An aggressive player, like I said. Not necessarily the type of aggression that I expected, but probably just felt confident enough that he could make this happen. And he did. I mean, when the Hellions are out of position, defending against any sort of attack like this from Zerg becomes very hard. Oh, yeah. If the Hellions just sit in the natural and you can kite back, I think it's doable. No matter how greedy his opening is, you know, all you need is three, four, five sweet volleys. Exactly. And the dream is alive. But mm -hmm. the moment that the Hellions are on the north side, the Lings and Banes are in the middle, and then you've got a few units here as well, that's when it becomes very hard to micro those that's Hellions. That's the moment, yeah. You've got Hellions coming out of your factory, you've got your Hellions on the map that needs to go back, and that's a really, really hard thing to do to micro those, those two parts of the army at the, at the same time. And that's where Zerglings, coming from every single direction, just shine against Hellions, because you can't do those fine sweeps, as you mentioned, against those Zerglings and Banelings. So just a perfect strategy, in my opinion, Mighty Kiwi, just so game-wise, like, you're a really greedy Terran, and mm -hmm. you don't scout that much, and uh, he, uh, especially considering the bailing nest wasn't even hidden. He was on the second, on the natural, on the ramp. He could have, uh, he could have scouted it really easily, but he didn't prepare for it. Didn't go for the scouts everywhere, so just got punished. Like I, I think it's a really, really uh, normal game. Like considering the strategy that uh, Mighty Kiwi used and Sight used, it's just a normal, uh, normal ending to that game. Zergs win because they go for the all in, and it's uh, that's something really, uh, really nice. Like. Uh, just strategically speaking, that was a right call. That's mm -hmm. what I mean. Well, we are going to announce the next player of Norway in just a couple of moments. After that, we're going to head over to a very small break, and then we'll continue with our very first Nation War of our Nation War Season 4 qualifier. Once again, today is going to be a long day, so we're not going to waste too much time. There's not going to be too many breaks. It's mostly going to be game, game, oh, game. Yeah. Otherwise, we're still going to be here tomorrow morning at 4 a.m., and considering the fact that I would have been up at 26 hours at that point. <laughs> Let's not do that, you know? We, we don't want that to, to, no. to happen. Uh, so the next player is going to be announced like mm. the, uh, in, a, in a couple of seconds. In 30, 30 seconds, seconds, we will know. Uh, I think it's just going to be Snoot. Snoot? Well, yeah, let's, just, let's keep it simple. I mean, we've got a Protoss player as well. Oh, 
Evar. Okay. 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 I like Just it. Keeping, keeping the, keeping the, you know, the the big bus to mm. the end. You know, like an actual bus. You need to go through the entire level. You take out everybody, and yeah. then Scoot comes in. It's risky though, because PVZ against Mighty Kiwi. Like I've been in that position mm -hmm. many times, and unless you're thrilling on your A game and you've got very solid build orders, Mighty Kiwi is a dangerous opponent. So uh, we're gonna head over to a very small break, and after that, we'll be back with game three between Norway and New Zealand. Alrighty guys, welcome back to the Nation War Season 4 Qualifiers brought to you by O-Gaming and Blizzard. Are you ready for some PvZ action, Funka? I'm actually super ready for that PvZ uh, series that's going to come in. Uh, it's cool to see a, lo a lo uh, different matchup because mm -hmm. we've seen two, two TVZs in a row. And uh, now we'll see what Mighty Kiwi has in store in the PvZ matchup. Why, will he go for a Bailing Bust again? Will he go for Roach Ravager? Uh, Is he going to be all inning again? It's very map dependent, I think, obviously, yeah. when it comes to PvZ. I'm not familiar with our Norwegian protos at all, by the way. I'm not sure if he had a different nickname in the past or if he plays under a barcode, but, you know, I've played my fair share of European ladder whenever I'm in Europe, mm -hmm. but I'm not that familiar with him, so I, I'm just hopefully... Um Hopefully, I'm going to be pleasantly surprised here by some very solid protos. I, I would say, like the the most important information that uh, that there is about him mm -hmm. is that he plays for Dead Pixels, which is not a bad team at all. Like uh, he used to have like pretty great players back in the day. Even Scarlet used to play for them. But um, uh, I, I don't know who he's going to fare against Mighty Kiwi, and that's also something cool about Nation Wars that you get to meet all of those new players and know about them and know mm -hmm. about their skill. The map is going to be Daybreak. So you mentioned map map dependency about builds. What do yeah, you think? Yeah, I don't think Daybreak is a great Great map for Zerg all-ins. There's a couple of weird builds where if they would go pool, gas, before hatch, and then they drop the hatch, and then it gets a little bit tricky as a Protoss player because you scout it, you're like, there is a potential they go aggressive here, but mm -hmm. at the same time, they can still macro their way out of it. I will never forget this one series that Nurture played against Showtime where I think he opened like that four times in a row, and four times Showtime was rather safe, and he's like, it's not happening. And then the fifth time, suddenly, you know, it's Antigua Shipyard cross map, and this time he does do a Roach <laughs> Ravenger rush. Like, that kind of stuff is very hard to deal with as yeah. a Proto, so it's important that, that he scouts well, but I think if our Norwegian Proto scouts well, this is a map that lends itself more towards macro-oriented play, yeah. where most of the time I'd say it comes down to a battle around the fourth rather than anything before that. Yeah, obviously, and historically it's been a really balanced map, like as we've seen, the ratio for ZVP are actually 50%. Ain't that great? This <laughs> just feels great to me. It's been a that great map for ZVZ over the years, that's for sure. Funk, oh, yeah. 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 The, oh, it was a period where Zerg was doing pretty well, and we yeah. had a lot of ZVZs back then. I can, uh, I can agree with Road that. Lord Even Stefano. Roadlords and Infestors and Roach Maxes. Oh, like, yeah. Uh, Roach Maxes. Roachling, yeah. Roachling Maxes around like the, I don't know, like 10 minute mark or something in for ZVP. Stefano used to get mm -hmm. all the games with this. For uh, me, Daybreak will always be linked to MLG Rally 2012, mm -hmm. where there was also the North and South American WCS finals back then, you know, the one that Scarlet won where Vibe got second. Oh, yeah, yeah. But throughout that weekend, of the 32 players that were there, I think there were like 20, 24 Zergs, and it was every single best of three started off with a ZVZ on Daybreak. And they're like, all right, Roddy Bitter, you guys up? And it's like ZVZ Daybreak. I was like, oh my God, here we go again. I'm going to have to introduce and talk yeah. about strategy, even though everybody knows how it's yeah. going to go. Yep. A couple uh, links, couple banes into Roach, Hydra, Remax, but that's not happening anymore. Obviously, the game is so much more dynamic right now. And, you know, I see on Twitter every now and then some people getting, oh, I'm already sick of this ladder map pool. I actually really like the current maps. I think they're great. Now, I have been traveling a lot, so I haven't been able to grind that many games. Mm -hmm. But I love seeing games on these maps, uh, especially just because I think, A, these maps have always been great, and B, the game is just so much better now than it's ever been. All right, I can agree with that. In the top right for New Zealand, he just took a game with a Ling Bailing all in, is their Zerg player, Mighty Kiwi. It's a great nickname, isn't it? I love Mighty Kiwi. And in the bottom left, for no way, he needs to uh, make it 2-1 for his team. He's probably the new, uh, and I can't remember Ike. his name, the new Aiki. Thank you so much. He's Evir. The new Aiki for Norway. Can he do the same? Can he go all in and take out everybody from New Zealand? Um, you mentioned Twitter a little bit earlier. And uh, obviously, send us our tweets. Send us your tweets with the hashtag NW4. You can send us pictures. You can send us memes. Everything you have in mind, just uh, give it to us. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll try to use it on the broadcast. And obviously, you can also use the hashtag Norwin uh, if you want Norway to win. And you can use the hashtag NZWin if you feel like uh, New Zealand is going to take it. And we'll 
be monitoring those numbers throughout the broadcast. And of course, send me pictures of your dogs. Obviously, dogs. Dogs are the best. Yep. Dogs will always go into the broadcast. I, I know that a lot of people like to post pictures of their cats, but I'm on the other team and I will always be on the other team. Cats got nothing on dogs, Funka. I, I totally agree. I'm actually Hashtag allergic dog to wins. Cats. Can we do that as well? <laughs> <laughs> we can monitor dog win and cat win. Like, yeah. we can monitor anything. Well, we, can, oh, oh. we can make that thing going. All right, so it was a very standard opening over here from Mighty Kiwi. We saw the hatch first, followed up with the pool, so nothing crazy yet. We see that our Norwegian Protoss has left his probe as well in the right bottom side, so he's going to play it uh, safe and sound. So far, I like his opening. Everything makes a lot of sense. He went gateway before the Nexus. I think you're going to go Nexus first here, but you know, if you go gateway before the Nexus, at least you have slightly quicker access to you know, your first and second adept, maybe. Shade the first two adepts across the map. Maybe get a couple of drones or even just the first adept to make sure you're not being all in. Yeah, for now the, uh, the adept uh, is getting built. He's, go he's gonna go for the mothership core quite quickly and go for a pylon block on the third hatchery. At least, like, it's gonna take a little bit of time for he uh, for Mighty Kiwi to uh, remove that pylon but also give the, uh, the information about the timing of the third hatchery. This is actually very annoying for Mighty Kiwi because <laughs> he sent his links to the other side of the map. Yep. So this is pretty much as annoying as it could be. Twilight Con, so it's going to be the choice of tech for now. I love it. Don't. I hopefully he hasn't been watching too many of those big dailies, and he's not going to start off with charge over here. We just want to. <laughs> we just want to see some resonating lift. Just so you want to see resonating lift, not at yeah. all like a. What about an archon drop? Yeah, you know? no, that's possible as well. But I think you know, opening up. Okay, it's going to be archon drop. <laughs> I'm just a big fan of resonating. Lift. Yeah, I know you don't. You don't like the the archon drop when I think it's actually the one of the greatest strategy yeah. protoses I've, I've come to with the, the PVZ matchup. I mean, obviously, uh, I cannot disagree with you. If every great Protoss around the world does it, then it's obviously a great build. But I don't know. I, I like the excitement of the adepts, especially right now. You know, they reduced the, the vision from nine to two. So it's full gamble, baby. <laughs> I want to see who's willing to go all in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, that Zergling is actually going to scout the Dark Shrine. And back in the days, we would have been like, Oh my god, he got scouted! Nobody yeah. gives a damn now. Everybody knows that it's going to go... Uh, that's going to be for uh, DTs that are going to be morphed in into Archons. So the fact that you get scouted doesn't mean that much. The Archons will still be able to do damage. And it's like a build really connected to how much you can micro, how much you can multitask. When uh, ju just macroing at the other side of the map, you can get those Archons and micro them perfectly. Thanks to the new Prism, which is such a great uh, addition. Like when I looked at it at the beginning, I was like, this is going to be super hard to work with to, uh, to actually uh, defend when you are a Terran player or even a Zerg player. But now that I see it played at this amount, uh, at this level, I'm just you know flabbergasted by how players can uh, can make happen like some amazing micro tricks. So just happy with the opening right there from uh, Evier. I was gonna go for that standard Archon drop into probably macro game, well, or maybe he, he can even uh, he can even go for a two base timing after that. Yep, I mean that's possible as well. So if we do see some charge, I mean maybe he's been taking some notes, not necessarily of the pig day. I was just kidding, by the way, pig daily daily joke because I love my boy Piggy. But, um, uh, you know, we saw SOS multiple times opening up with a couple of Dark Templars and then following it up with a solid 7 or 8 gate. Sometimes with a third Nexus, sometimes not. Sometimes with a lot of sentries, sometimes just with a crazy amount of Zealots. you got to be careful here with your Dark Templars. He warped in three DTs. He's not afraid of these links, but he should be afraid of the roaches that are coming out. Make sure you don't lose any DTs. They're too expensive. Yeah, also. Obviously, you don't want to lose anything, but that's also something that some players just forget to do. Yet, there you can still poke with those DTs. You don't have to morph them into archons right away. So, as he uh, as he did right there, just got a couple of links, pushed back the queen. So, just you know, maybe one less transfusion, one less creep tumor, and now you can make it into archon. Those pylons are a tiny bit late. A lot of links are making their way across the map. Oh, I'm yeah. not sure if there's a wall off, but even if there's a wall off, these pylons, I don't think they're going to be done in time. Yeah. And if you can jump on these pylons, you can get a couple of probes as well. Actually, he's going to go oh. for the Nexus instead. That's perhaps not a bad choice either. Will he be able to force a cancer here? Yes, he will. Well done, Mighty Kiwi. Yeah, great play by Mighty Kiwi, just realizing that the units were not in place and that he could get something done with the, that huge swell of Zerglings. He needs to go back to the droning side of things, though, yeah, like, and he's he doing it at the moment. Yeah. So that's uh, all great for him, getting the cancel, just pushing back that third base. Okay, the Adept was here. I wasn't sure if the Adept was blocking the wall, but he is. Just one Zergling just squeezing through. Couple of drones dying at Archon the opposite drop. side of the map because those Archon drops are actually getting into play. A lot of Zerglings going down, two drones, and obviously 
not losing anything. And considering Archon are just mainly shield, you will have like full HP units just in a couple of seconds for our Protoss player. Yeah, but he still took a lot of damage on the shields, and mm -hmm. in general, you want to even prevent that. That's why sometimes yeah. you see the Korean Protosses, and it looks like they're being overly fancy when they just pick it up, shot, pick it up, and it's like, well, that seems like a little bit of over micro, but it actually prevents these Archons from taking any real damage. It's not about saving them, it's just about trying to get as much value as possible, because now we saw both Archons being a little low on HP, so he does have to wait. Yeah, once again, some probes like getting that. picked up, no units in the vicinity, and no Mothership Core to uh, Photon of a Challenge. He's gonna lose all those Zerglings, so that's still a really great pickup, I guess, for Evire. Um, those Archons, there, yeah, as you mentioned, they took a lot of damage to their shields, so they need to be a little bit more cautious, so that's the, that's the reason we've seen him uh, just picking off some uh, tumors instead of units or drones in the main, just taking a sweet time, but didn't deal that much damage, to be honest. No, he didn't, and he, yes, he forced out units, but those units actually accomplished something, so <laughs> it really wasn't that bad. If he can get a cancel here, uh, well, he definitely doesn't want, he wants it to get way more than a cancel, because he didn't oh, yeah. actually make that many extra probes. This is a scary push. He does have the Mothership Core, so he's not necessarily all in. We saw that Blink has finished up as well. How many Banelings are we looking at? Baneling speed is nowhere near done. No, not uh, at all. And wow. No Banelings yet. There's going to be a couple of them, like probably about 10. Nice force field. We're going to go for the Corrosive Bail and take those out. And that was, that's a great time warp. But he needs to split against those Banelings. This is working so well for Evire. Uh, well, maybe not. Maybe uh, not. He's taking maybe quite we'll a, see. It, it looks promising, but he took quite a bit of damage from these Banes. A lot of Links are coming in as well. The reinforcements are massive. Good corrosive valves there by Mighty Kiwi. Yes, drones are dying. If he can get the prison, that would be massive. He's not going to go for the prison. He tries to kill Blink Stalkers instead. Somehow gets one. If you're, if you're, he's gonna, he's gonna take it. He just took out all the drones, and now he can even maybe blink on the Ravager. He doesn't need to do it because if there's a huge swell of Zerglings after that, it's, it could be get, it could be getting a little dicey for the Protoss player. So he's just gonna take out that third hatchery, maybe fight a little bit more. The wrap around from the Zerglings, one side of the Blink Stalkers actually gonna get out. Nice dodging of the bile, and just only four or five Ravagers remaining. Wow, more Stalkers being wiped in. You are spot on, Funk. I wasn't totally sure, but if yeah. it was going to be enough for our Protoss, but it's starting to look very, very promising for our Norwegian Toss here as he's taking a pretty commanding army supply advantage, kept the Warp Prism alive, did a pretty good job in dodging most of those corrosive balls. And look at these stalkers, a lot of them have been taking a beating, but they're all still alive. Okay, the Zerglings once again for the wraparound, there's no adept in that decomposition. The drones are actually drilling a little bit and getting some damage done. The prism is gonna fall down. That's a huge mistake from Evir. He needs to have a lot more units to probably finish this game. So he's gonna just go out, right click on one of his own stalker. But the Mothership Core is dealing damage in the main. There is no queens. No NTA whatsoever, except the Bile. Can he get another Ravager? The Bile is not going to connect there. Oh, that's a risky blink as well, because a lot of links are coming in. But it seems like it was good enough, as he was able to get the majority of these Ravagers. And he still has that Mothership Core as well. Now even the Stalkers are making their way across the map. GG. Wow, well done. Good good attack there. Yeah, Very good attack. Really great attack. And to be honest, like we've we've been... Uh, we, we didn't see uh, the, 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 the two base only coming in. Like, yeah. okay, he's actually crossing the map. Map. He got the cancel on the. Th I don't know if the cancel of the, on the Nexus actually made him go for that uh, tide mm. of push. I mean, he chrono boosted out Blink, so I think he kind of wanted to do it. There's yeah. many ways you can follow it up, and I guess that's one of the reasons why the Archon drop that you love so much is so popular because it, it gets a little tricky for the Zerg. The yeah. Zerg has to defend against it and then still has to worry about all the potential follow ups. Could just be straight up macro, could be, you know, Blink stock a sentry attack, it could be mass zealot, and it gets a little tricky to figure out what mm. exactly do they need. And you could see Mighty Kiwi was a little bit caught off guard as well. Exactly. Yeah, he, he totally believed in that third Nexus. That mm -hmm. was a lie. That was a lie. There was no well, probes getting produced anywhere. TLO would say it's transitional. Yeah. Which it is. You have the Nexus. Yeah. You can go back to a third base situation. That, that's why I liked uh, about, uh, about Evir's push is that the moment he takes every single drone from the third base and probably gets the hatchery, like he wouldn't click on it, like every single pro player I know, mm -hmm. the hatchery remains there with like 15 HP. Come on, please, just click on it. So he doesn't go for it, but he would, he would take it anyways. And that's a great position to be in uh, as, a, as a Protoss player. You've got a little bit more probes than your opponents. You've got a third Nexus going on, the Blink, uh, the, the Blink 
think uh, technology is great for you. So just a great game from uh, from Evier. And as you said, Mighty Kiwi just didn't see it coming. Mm -hmm. Next player is obviously going to be the last man standing for New Zealand, but also the biggest name that they've ever had, I think, in StarCraft 2. It's going to be Petraeus. I love how you brought up the latest stages of Heart of the Swarm, because back then, Petraeus was an absolute monster. Oh, yeah. I think it was Krakow as well, right, where he finished top 8, uh -huh. correct? Uh -huh. And he looked really good. I think for even... Uh, you know, for a couple of series, I was starting to legitimately believe that Petraeus could win that tournament because oh, his yeah. late game EVP was so incredibly good yeah. that I really thought he p could perhaps go all the way. And of course, since then, he has retired. I think he went back to studying. But these guys, if you once upon a time, if you're that good in StarCraft, it takes them 20, 30 games and they will still have a very, very respectable level immediately. So yeah. this is going to be the real test for our Norwegian protos. If he, if, he, if he feels like he can be in the team that all, uh, already tells you that he's been GM. Mm -hmm. That's the reason, that, that's, uh, that's what you need to be in 2016 to be uh, inside of a, yeah. a Nation Wars team is to, you have to be GM on uh, one server, whether it is Europe, NA or Korea. So that already tells you that he's already in the top 200 of a, of a major server. So obviously this guy knows, knows how to play, but as you mentioned, he needs 30, 40 games probably to get back on a really, really sick form. Mm -hmm. I mean, he won't be near, you know, the godlike form that he had once upon a time. Yeah. But he'll be at a level where he can macro properly, he can execute, and he can identify at least a little bit what he's up against. And that's often good enough for these guys to, you know, still participate in a tournament like Nation Wars mm -hmm. and maybe go on a sick run, you know, like throughout the history of RTS. My all, I'm not going to tell the entire story, but my all-time favorite RTS story is Creophilus winning World Cyber Games in Warcraft 3. A guy that retired, he did very well, got second place in an ESWC, won BlizzCon, he said, guys, it's been beautiful, but you know, I'm, I'm going to go back to studying. You know, a couple months later, there were national qualifiers in Norway. He's like, well, I'm still Creo, I can do this. Goes to the World Cyber Games with pretty much no practice at all, sits in the airplane with a notebook, draws out a couple strategies, and wins the World Cyber Games, the most prestigious tournament in Warcraft 3. Like an absolute amazing story. Now, I don't think that Petraeus is going to all no. kill Korea in Nation War Season 4, but uh, I hope that he can uh, show us some great games here. That would yeah, already be de fun. Definitely, and if he can make it happen in a PvZ, as you mentioned, that was one of his strong suit, getting to that late game situation mm -hmm. and using all those units with a lot of spells. Like He loves that. And in terms of army management, Petraeus was one of the best in the business. So I hope he can bring this in against Evier, which uh, who just played a pretty decent game against Mighty Absolutely. Kiwi, but also uh, an up-and-coming player. So we don't know anything. We don't know that much about him <laughs> yet. So uh, uh, it's either a story of Evier can take the game and you know makes a strong statement in terms of level for himself, or Petraeus comes back. I either way, I'm gonna be happy. Yeah, I already like where this is going today, Nation War Season 4, because we're going to see a couple of these guys that we're not that familiar with, but they're showing us here, like, hey, we're absolutely capable of executing those builds that you guys are familiar with, and you guys may not know us very well, but we do know the builds, and we're able to, you know, make a name for ourselves over here. So things are looking good so far. This is just the very first Nation War of the six that we are going to have. There's a B stream as well, so if you guys are like, oh, it's taking too long, I want to see more StarCraft, you know, where's game for uh, twitch.tv slash gauntlet sc2? Um, they were supposed to start with the Netherlands. Is that didn't happen? I don't know. Uh, maybe it's Taiwan, Haas, sometime yeah, yeah, soon. Yeah, 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 Taiwan, Japan. That, that could be. The, that could be the case. We will be uh, confirming <laughs> this. But just don't hesitate to up on the, the, that second stream if you want to. Everybody follow has the two monitors, right? Funka? Of course, of course. Get. The, Get the multi Twitch going, mm -hmm. like get all the streams up. Like you should actually check a little bit of the French stream because there's gonna be a lot of yelling, a lot of a lot of crazy French people just uh, screaming everywhere. So it's always a nice thing uh, to watch. Maybe in the qualifiers, but in the main event, I'm not too sure. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. Just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, no, France is not bad. <laughs> you guys still got a good team, but it's gonna be hard to. Uh, how do you say oh, that? No. You know, uh, redo the success Going back of to back, year. you mean? Yeah. Going back to back in Nation Wars is going to be super, super mm. hard for friends, obviously. We all hope. We, 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 uh, we have a lot of hopes for it, obviously. But the, the lineup doesn't look too shabby, too. Like yeah. Drogo, a Marine Lord, Stefano, because obviously Stefano is always going to be on the team. That, that's just the way it is, right? I mean, uh, the most or second most successful. F well, I think technically people still look at Stefano as the most successful foreigner of all time. Mm -hmm. You know, in the old school, it was always a debate between Naniwa and Stefano. Uh, some would say Scarlett as well. And yeah. then there were a couple of other players, uh, Jinro, 
you know, some people would say Idra, but I think that, that goes a little too far. <laughs> little but bit. I think in this day and age, I mean, Snoot is the foreigner he that is. has gathered the most prize money, mm-hmm. so you got to give him some credit as well. And, um, you know, some people like to think that StarCraft was harder back in the days. I, I mean, you could say that the competition was very fierce, but the skill level right now is absolutely higher than oh, it yeah. was back then. And the fact that a player like Snoot has been... You know, not just consistent, but has been uh, relevant for this many years already, where once upon a time he started off as a little bit of an online hero and slowly but steady got more offline success. I, I really think you can make a very strong case for Snoot being perhaps oh, yeah. the he, most successful he's foreigner got a, of he's all got time. He's got a great story with the, with the way that he got uh, he got in esports, and uh, it's a, just a treat to see him play uh, day in, day out. He's a fierce competitor, as you said. And uh, our next map is going to be Overgrowth. So, once again, you know, Blast from the past, mm-hmm. uh, old map that uh, we used to play a lot. It was played in every single tournament. We had it in Pro League 2, we had it in Korea, in Europe, in NA. Yeah. Just a you know, general great, great ma- you know, stand-up map, I- I'd say. Not really that much of a macro yeah. map because it's so tiny. Like Games usually mm-hmm. end up a little bit earlier than uh, you know, for a whirlwind, for instance. But still a pretty good map in every single matchup. That's uh, something that I like about it. Yeah, Overgrowth was the map where all the pro players seem to have like a mutual challenge gentleman's agreement where we don't veto Overgrowth. You yeah. know, we veto the other weird maps, but Overgrowth will either be the decider or we're going to kick things off in Overgrowth because everybody loved Overgrowth. You know, every matchup, every race. Was well, just a very fair map. If you guys are wondering what's taking so long, Roddy, you've promised us immediate games. Well, Petraeus had a small hiccup, but I believe that he's pretty much good to go. So yeah. hopefully we can uh, hop into game four real quick. Last man standing for New Zealand. Of yep. course, there is a good chance that if he loses, that we'll see him again unless <laughs> Petraeus yeah. would just have no confidence at all. Then I guess we could see Mighty Kiwi again, who I think you know showed us that he's very capable of playing some excellent stock. That, that, that's the thing. Like uh, I guess considering what Crimson did, like you don't maybe you don't mm. want him to be the revived player. But I think you can make a case for Mighty Kiwi. It depends entirely on yep. what kind of Petraeus is going to show right now. Like we want to yeah. see how good he can play. Can I he think, make it uh, to the late game situation we mentioned. I think we're still going to see a good Petraeus over yeah. here. Like I'm, I'm not that worried about it. Mm. He might not be as clean as he was, you know, back then when it comes to controlling all these spellcasters. Right now, perhaps even more. You know, you got to worry about the Viper two and stuff. I'm not sure how experienced he is with that. But when it just comes to early game scouting, when it comes to map awareness, when it comes to macroing and being on point, creep threat. Petraeus, you know, like that guy can take a break of a year and a half, two years. He's still going to be incredible. Yeah, good. he showed he showed some really nice things uh, during Nation Wall Street, actually going through qualifiers with uh, New Zealand. He was mm-hmm. he was here back then, and that's where he showed like some pretty good uh, understanding of the Viper plays. So, because remember, Nation Wall Street was just after the release of Legacy of the Void, and here we are. This game is actually on the way, and we'll be able to introduce those players on the top right for no way. It's going to be easier. Over here on the left bottom side of the map, we're looking at the main base of our Zerg, representing New Zealand, the one and only Petraeus. Yeah, I missed him, I missed him. He should have made an appearance yesterday in that Wiley Team League. Perhaps could have stopped the Muslim. Then again, can anybody truly stop and unfire the Muslim? Uh, I don't don't think anybody can. Maybe Neeb later today, or Natanius. (laughs) We're going to have an intern clan kill. Oh, if uh, if a Nate versus Ben uh, situation happens, like I'm gonna lose it for sure. Uh, a TVT, like considering how much uh, Netanias loves TVT, is gonna have a blast uh, playing probably uh, against the Muslim. So, uh, in terms of opening gateway on low ground with the pylon, nothing too fancy from uh, from Evia going for the Nexus afterwards. Gonna drop down that cyber core. What do you expect from uh, Evia on this map? Uh, I'm expecting something similar, I think. Uh, I think a lot of people who love the Dark Templar Archon drop opening, they're not afraid to do it multiple times in a row. I personally don't think Overgrove is the best map for Carriers or Stargate play, so I'm kind of expecting him to do the same thing. You know, I want to give a small mention. The once upon a a time I was playing some games on Overgrove, and you know, I like falling off on this map, but sometimes you get bailing busted and the links can run into your ramp immediately. If you, as a Protoss player, let's say if you keep the hole on the right side, you know, then they can, if they run fast, they immediately yep. run up the ramp. And I was like, man, it's so annoying. And then somebody in my twi- uh, chat was like, Roddy, why don't you always have the gap on the left side? And even if the links stream through, they still have to go all the way around the Nexus. I was like, well, uh, 
you know, I got nothing. That's actually <laughs> the greatest advice that anybody's ever given me. Thank you. So I'm happy to see that, uh, you know, I know Norwegian Protoss <laughs> is falling off in the correct way as well. Uh, actually, you know, yeah. I think you make a lot of sense. Yeah. I didn't even think about it. Yeah, of course. Like, those kind of tiny adjustments can make makes so a big difference. much difference yeah. of course uh, in this matchup once again don't hesitate to go on twitter maybe i wasn't clear enough before but use the hashtag norwin if you think norway is going to take it so n-o-r win w-i-n and uh, for new zealand it's going to be hashtag n-z win so, and we'll, uh, we'll be monitoring those numbers as I mentioned earlier. That Adept is going to try to scout a little bit. That Shade, not seeing anything changes so much. I can't believe when we see the vision here, it's like, he used to see everything and now you don't see anything. As you mentioned, it's more of a gamble now if you want to Shade in. Yep, I mean, especially with a single Adept, you don't really want to do it. Interesting opening here by Petraeus, getting a uh, quick plus one melee. Uh, I don't mind it at all. Well, Dropaloid being researched already as well. This could actually work out great. I mean, if this is one of these openings where as a Protoss player you fly your prism across the map, you're wiping a couple of Dark Templar as well. Actually, I think this is going to be quite a bit before. No, that is not my uh, favorite. Well, I guess it's not that weird. It's a it looks a little ugly, but I guess the wall you know, still gets the job done. But he doesn't know anything about this Dropaloid. That's going to have made its way into the main base probe. Oh, the vision so close. Now okay. he sees it. Will he react on time? He needs those adept in the main base because the mothership core is out of position. So no uh, pylon overcharge right over there. Oh, no, those eight zerglings are going to be unloaded and they're going to get some probes. No reaction from Evie. He needs to pull out all those probes. Four probes already. Uh, this pylon is going to get taken out as well, which means it's going to be actually quite hard to clean this up. So not only will this do a little bit of damage, it also delays his build by quite a bit. Look at the amount of lost mining time that we currently have to deal with. If you want to warp in four Dark Templars, you can't afford to lose seven probes, lose this much gas mining as well. Uh, solid opening here by Petraeus. Eight getting so probes. much done. Oh, eight probes. And as you can see, the income advantage right there is like more than a, than a, than a thousand in favor of our Zerg player that uh, just finished third base, is trans transferring some drones, just getting ready for the next step, getting spores down in case that uh, 4DT drop uh, is not actually a knock-on drop, but DT is in the first place, which he showed in game in, uh, in the previous game. So just perfect play from Petraeus, getting a lot of work done. Mm -hmm. with that just like tiny overload drop without even the speed, Roddy. Yep, one uh, one weakness, I think, of this build in general, they have that few units, and if you want to go up to three bases, most of the time you send your Mothership Core there, because mm -hmm. the Mothership Core is supposed to cast Photon Overcharge to keep your Nexus alive, which obviously leaves your main base vulnerable. Uh, Dark Templars are going to try to find an opening here. There is a Spore, you've got to be careful that you don't let all three Dark Templars attack the Spore. Now the War Prism actually takes a little bit of damage, but I say you got to be careful, but of course Petraeus is careful, because Petraeus is very good at this beautiful game. Oh yeah, he is, and he's showing a really great game. Uh, like his opening is not the, the most common, but he made it work with those eight zerglings and just got like the perfect angle to attack from and drop all those zerglings without getting seen by Evier that had the mothership core out of position. So I'm obviously liking the position for Petraeus on this game. Getting 58 drones on the board, gonna get four more plus one attack for range. The Glyro reconstitution for the roaches and the banelingness. So roachling bane. Ravager composition that could work really well on this map. Let's see if these Archons will be able to get some work done. A couple of drones will get picked up immediately. You gotta be very careful sometimes. Oh, the drones clump up. The Archons can get <gasps> magic hits off here. Well Whoa. done. Ah, oh, that's nine. Okay. Uh -huh. Uh, that, that was a little bit too eager to, uh, to get back on, uh, on mining. And as you mentioned, that could go super wrong because the power is definitely overwhelming with those things. Uh -huh. Oh, triple Evo, actually. He uh, maybe forgot about the third one, but he could go for range and melee. That's what he's, uh, was, what he's about to do right now, but he could also add the carapace. And that's some nice pickups because wow. each Ravager is actually super costly and he can't get those uh, those uh, those Archons at the same I mean, time. I think like. Petraeus was busy with Lynx on the other side of the map, mm. which actually got picked up as well, but losing these Ravagers. Now these Archons can start working on this hatchery. I don't think he's going to be able to get the kill here, but this is still annoying. I'm not sure if that's enough, though. If he micros these Archons, a little bit. I think he can do it. He can actually got a snipe on this fourth base. Oh, oh my so god, so close. close! 
so close from uh, from Ivy. He needs that to get back into this game. That would have been a great yeah. kill, but he couldn't get it in the end. Even though uh, Petraeus actually biled his own hatchery, uh, he did make the pr the prism go away, which made a lot a lot of difference. And now he has units following. Mm, I must say, Petraeus looked a little bit sloppy in the last minute and a half of this game. You know, first lost a few more drones than he perhaps should have lost, and lost these ravages as well rather uh, carelessly. And now almost lost the fort. At least he kept that one alive, mm -hmm. but. It's safe to say that Evire is still totally in this game. Yeah, he is totally in. He's actually making a lot of stuff happen with that prism, uh, with those two Archons. Getting some more drones, gonna get some links, two drones, two more drones, and a uh, prism that is still alive didn't take any damage to his actual hit points. So great play by uh, by Evire. Yeah, the only issue I think I see for our Protoss is yeah. that he's pretty far behind when it comes to upgrades. I mean, triple Evo, <laughs> all the upgrades are going down. I mean, even the upgrade tab is showing us as well. It's just <laughs> plus Disgusting. one. That's pretty much the only thing that he has going for himself. Is there no blink? This okay, blink's halfway down. Yeah. He likes to blink follow up. Not gonna go for the glaive. Like you, you, you don't really want to do it like too late, I guess, in yeah. this game. But you could anticipate mo maybe the charge. But you're gonna go for the blink again. Uh, well, actually, Petraeus opening every single technology possible. He's gonna go for the hive. Gonna go for the spore and the triple upgrade. I want to get everything, and that's the reason he needs that fourth base. And not getting it cancelled makes a whole lot of difference. Random cross of balls being uh, thrown down, trying to do some damage on this prism. But the Spire hovered down as well. Obviously, Brute Lords are always fantastic against these Archon Immortal Blink Stalker based armies. There's a lot of people who still think, like, oh, if you can get enough Stalkers, it's not that bad, right? Well, if the Zerg messes up, no, then it's not that bad. But if the Zerg has proper Brute Lord positioning, you're gonna have a very hard time dealing with that army if you don't have any Tempest yourself or maybe some surprise Void Race. Yeah, I agree with it. And uh, I think, like, in my opinion, Petraeus should get the gold as fast as possible just to make the creep go a little bit further. Like, he can drop the hatchery and cancel it if he gets pushed and doesn't have the units in place. But I feel like he could have had this uh, hatchery going up a little bit earlier so to get the creep and a lot, little bit more map control and make, you know, the progression of the Protoss player a little bit harder. But he's making a lot of stuff happening with that prism. So I guess, the you know, killing creep tumors helps a lot with this. As Kevin, our observer, is showing though, this great Aspire is morphing now, Fonka, and that's mm -hmm. one thing that I'm a tiny bit worried about for Avire. Like, if he wants to make something happen with the current army composition that he's working with, he's really got to start marching across the map now. Five extra gates have been thrown down. He did know about the Spire, but I think it's always hard to have a good feel for when those Broodlords will come out. But this is pretty much the moment, man. You got to start rallying those Immortals and all. Uh, all that good stuff that you have to offer as a pros player across the map. Oh yeah. The further you, s the longer you sit back, if you don't have a stargate, it's going to be a very, very difficult story for you. Yeah, obviously for people that remember that uh, that period of time where Broodlord Infestor was all the rage. Well, you need to do a pre-Broodlord timing. That's exactly what you're supposed to do. And he's taking a lot, a lot of time to actually cross the map with a lot of Archons and Immortals. He could do some damage right now. He's got to be careful as well because seven Corruptors or eight Corruptors are oh, about yeah. to pop. And that means that this War Prism is in a lot of the danger. Oh yeah, that actually coming Rain out a little bit. Yep. Yeah, this, uh, this Prism I think it's gonna fall. It's absolutely oh, yeah. gonna fall. Here are the Corruptors. The Archons will at least get unloaded, so they may be able to get a couple of links or a painting or two, but uh, expensive loss. And now he should know that the time is really ticking. You can oh, see yeah. immediately he's moving these units a little bit. I like what Petraeus is doing as well setting himself up very aggressively. Yeah, he's got uh, an amazing map control. He controls both Zell, Zell Nagas. He's Ooh. got some Zerglings in the way. What, what, oh, what, 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 what? the units are splitting no, for the no. Protoss player. What a lot doing? of free units, free Archons, free Stalkers. Can he get them? There's no Prism to save them. Great force field, though. He's going to save a little bit, but he did lose an Archon. He did lose a couple of Stalkers. Seven. And that's not something you want to you wanna have when you're about to face Broodlords. There you can see that ugly wall of kind of working against him as well as these links are getting a crazy amount of surface area. One gateway did get picked off. That's not that big of an issue as he has plenty of gateways. What is a much bigger issue is that there is a great fire with seven, eight corruptors on the way. Eight more corruptors. Actually, they already morphed into brute lords, oh, yeah. and the first target is not even done yet. Okay, he's gonna try to get under those brute lords, maybe get some nice connection with those archons, but this is not working at all. The bile is falling from the sky. The mothership core is gonna get taken down. So no recall and a lot of super expensive units, immortals, archons, sentries are going down, and there's nothing he can do against those brute lords. Reyes making them Brute Lords work against Protoss since 2012, if not earlier, as he's always been so successful with this unit. 
The stock account is high, but right now if he would blink forward, then these ravages will absolutely obliterate these stalkers and obviously the brute lords and the brute links as well. First void ray is being produced. There is one of these forward blinks, but look at these stalkers. They are melting. And we mentioned the transfuse, the composition is perfect from pitch rays. The brute lords will not fall. GG called out to the two. Wow. Petraeus. Making it happen. All tied up, and that obviously means that Norway only has one player left, but that's a very good player. We already spoke about him a little bit before. It's good old Jens. Snoot, Liquid Snoot, he's going to be the next man up. And then eventually this is going to go to a revive where, uh -huh. well, I mean, I, I think looking at Petraeus there, even though he looked a tiny bit sloppy in one phase in the game, mm. other than that, it still looked solid yeah. and still looked as... Uh, Kind of what we were predicting and hoping exactly, for. Exactly, exactly. That's uh, the, that's how, how you can show that uh, that Petraeus is playing his actual mm -hmm. his actual game plan, like we expected. Late game compositions, mm -hmm. lots of macro play, brood lots coming in, transfuses, queens, and it happens. So Petraeus is playing super well. And as you mentioned, with the revive system, we could have that classic best of three within a best of seven uh, between Snoot and uh, Petraeus. That I would be great. I love these guys. We're going to have six best of sevens over here. And they're like, for the first one, let's send them at least to, uh, you know, 4-2. <laughs> Potential even 4-3. Things starting to look a tiny bit dicey for Norway, but they still have their ace player, if not twice so you mm -hmm. know uh, you could say there is no real upset potential yet but yeah. you know could happen yeah, it, it could, could absolutely happen. happen a couple of I CBZs can see, I can see I can see Petraeus making the upset that would be that would be huge if Norway would uh, would, uh, would went out would go out sorry in the first round obviously the next player for Norway is going to be Snoot is the only one remaining uh, as we mentioned there's going to be a revive coming up because you do have to score four points uh, but all of that is going to happen after a quick commercial break we go back with the fifth game between Petraeus and Snoot All right, everyone, welcome back to uh, Nation Wars Season 4, the so qualifiers, season. that is. Of course, StarCraft 2 Nation Wars brought to you by O Gaming and Blizzard. Well, we're getting ready to hop into the fifth match. It's going to be a ZVZ between Snoot and Petraeus. I think a lot of people looked at this Nation War, so Norway... New Zealand, oh, okay, Snoot vs. Petraeus. Exactly. That's, I think, a the way that a lot of the fans looked at it. That, that, uh, that's something that is really cool about Nation Wars, mm -hmm. that we get those kind of situations quite often, but you still get to uh, you know, discover those new players. But mm -hmm. I guess there's a lot of teams that have that, that kind of uh, you know, one guy, one man army feeling that, that that's the guy that you're anticipating to do well. And we're going to have that matchup already because no all kill happened. It's like a, it's a really back and forth game yeah. right now, two to two, and we'll have Petraeus against Snoot. That's something we expected out of New Zealand versus Norway. I'm also uh, already really uh, psyched about it. It's going to be played on Echo. Hmm. A ZVZ on Echo. I think mm. it's... This Echo is a map, I think, where it's hard to pull off a whole lot of funky, strange, surprising stuff, which in general should be very suited towards Snoot's playstyle, because yep. we all know, I think, how just all around Snoot is. Like, I don't think Snoot truly has one weakness. In the old days, no. people would say his only weakness was that he was too macro-oriented, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But I think that's not even necessarily the case anymore. Uh, we'll talk about this player actually spawning up to the top left of the match. The map, and he actually has two Nation Wars title under his belt. He's from Norway. He's Snoot, main player for the team, and he's gonna go against uh, the top player from New Zealand in the bottom right as a Zerg in the red. This is New Zealand's Petraeus. I think it's safe to say that Snoot still had a very successful 2016. Um, a lot of people may not necessarily look at 2016 as an amazing year for Snoot because they look at the global finals of WCS and be like, oh, that was disappointing. You know, he was eliminated first in his group, losing against Stats and Drogo. But the year is more than just the global finals. Snoot was victorious in Mexico during the WCS Copa. I think that was the best StarCraft he played all year long. He yeah. was amazing that tournament, beat Showtime, beat Neep. It was fantastic to watch and also had a couple of great victories in China. Forgot the name, um, not of the GPL, but the other one that was slightly before WCS Mexico. But basically, Snoot won like fifty-five or sixty thousand dollars within three weeks of playing StarCraft too. So yeah. <laughs> I think it's safe to say that overall, it's been a pretty decent year. Also yeah. made it to the finals of the Intel Extreme Masters Katowice, the WCS Season One uh, Global Playoffs. So safe to say, I think 2016 was a good year for Snoot. 
definitely a great year for Snoot and actually getting some uh, other victories than Home Story Cup. It was his tournament, you know, <laughs> but he had struggles to go uh, deeper in other tournaments and probably didn't have that much uh, that much success in those other tournaments. But in 2016, he does have the, the results that we anticipated from him. So Snoot went with a really early pool in this game, but not really to put some some aggression, even though we see uh, Speedling coming in and the Baneling Nest. I felt like it was more of a defensive opening, but he could switch the aggression with the speed kicking in super, super fast because Petraeus didn't even pay for it, got some gas, but he's not going gonna go for the, uh, for the speedling upgrade. Yeah, interesting here. Yeah. We can already see him having a 4-5 worker advantage now. Um, hmm. Tiny bit surprised by how this one is playing out, but we'll see. Maybe he's gonna try to morph a couple of banelings with these zerglings that are taking a pretty awkward route. Yeah. I mean, that has to be the plan here, correct? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree, I agree totally. The, the, actually, the two first Banelings are actually getting morphed on the right side. Yeah, here it is. And there is two more uh, Zerglings. Here, is he going to go for four Banelings? Uh, that was close. I don't know. Uh, okay, yeah, he's going to go for three. Uh, three Banes and maybe a fourth when he has the gas for it. And he's, he's six gas short. <laughs> <laughs> he cut it a little yeah. bit too early. So there's a spine crawler for Petraeus, but no speed, as we mentioned. Is he gonna? Yeah, he's actually gonna evacuate all those drones, and I think that's the right call for Petraeus because he's got no way of having a proper fight against speedlings with his own slow links. But it's also important that he doesn't do this for too long. I mean, doing yes. this for a split second is all right, but well, here come these bailings as well. What is he gonna do with the bailings? Bailings will connect with the spine crawler, and the spine crawler does fall pretty much immediately. But there is a second spine as well. Multiple queens here to defend. And we can see that Petraeus is actually going to be more than fine. Okay, but did, did Petraeus really stop playing at some point? I think uh, that was a really, really great defense. I mean, the timing of the second, uh, the second spine crawler was decent enough. He didn't lose as many resources as his opponent, as uh, we can see in the top left of the screen. And now gets the, the lair as the, as the first player to actually build it. Gets some roaches going down. Like, he, he did skip speedling, but that didn't cost him anything. Yeah, and well, he gets roaches obviously way, way before Snoop gets his uh, roach warrant even up. So yep. that's very nice for our our Kiwi. I mean, we can just call him Kiwi. He may not be mighty Kiwi, yep. but he's definitely a Kiwi. He's going up to three bases, just like Snoot on the other side of the map. It would be awesome if Snoot was able to make something happen with a couple of speed links. Now, if you invest into speed links and you invest into a bailing nest, you'd love to at least go up to three bases quite a bit before your opponent. But I also understand that Snoot is not going ham now on the Zergling production, because if Snoot would waste, you know, 10, 12 larvae right now on 24 links and he doesn't get the cancel, yeah. well, then he puts himself in a very rough position. Yeah, you can see, uh, you know, those, those kind of situations swing super fast when you don't use your lava properly in ZVZ. And as you mentioned, Zerglings, not really great in terms of lava efficiency, and uh, you'd rather make drones uh, for, a third sorry, for a third base sorry, than uh, making 24 links, especially if you're not going to achieve anything with it. So both players going to go for that third base. Swallow of Zerglings coming in from mm. Snoot, but not well, such a big one. No, but he also made a lot of uh, roaches. So oh, I yeah. actually think that Snoot is just gearing up for a massive hatchery attack oh, yeah. here. It's important for Petraeus to sniff this out as quick as possible. Uh, he's got that spine crawler already. If Petraeus makes nothing but units, I mean, I don't think he... It. Yeah, I don't think he overdrawn. I mean, it's six drones extra, but I think he was able to get away with that because of the early stages with plus one missile attacks on the way as well. This really doesn't look all that bad for Petraeus. Yes, he's down in army supply, but he will have the defender's advantage. And if Petraeus holds here, he's in a phenomenal spot yeah. with lay attack, with road speed and plus one missile attacks. But can he hold? He has transfuse energy, he's got a spine, he's got a lot of roaches coming. Cooling tower. And he will not be uh, supply block during all of this because he went for that three extra overlords. Can he defend that third base? He's gonna go for it, it's a little bit late. He's gonna get uh, fended out by those Gorosif, but actually gonna try to get an overlord in the background, but the Zerglings get the wraparound. And that's not looking really good for Petraeus oh. because the bio's gonna connect and it's connecting super hard. Petraeus losing a lot of really important roaches right there. Yeah, those balls were massive, good wraparound around by Snoot. I really think those balls could have made the difference here. Snoot is going to tack up behind this right now, but he may actually just secure victory for himself, as there really isn't that much remaining over here for Petraeus. No, there's no sense in attacking that evolution chamber, as plus one is done. But these links are causing a massive trouble yeah. uh, for Petraeus, as he's just not able to get close to these ravages of Snoot. He doesn't really have the numbers. He's gonna try to target down those Ravagers, but some more Zerglings are gonna go uh, streaming down the map and go to the natural of our New Zealand player. Zerglings getting the roaches out. Those, so, the, those two Ravagers are gonna, actually gonna fall. Can 
Petraeus really only, only has like 33 drones. Actually, he can go back to a really normal game. And right. Snoots, keep in mind, didn't get the third hatchery. Yeah. It's in the red though. That I was very surprised by. I mean, it's incredibly low on HP and he's rallying in more links. Snoot was thinking about going for it for a split second there, but he does not get it. And things looked very dicey for a second, but Snoot perhaps over committing a tiny bit. Maybe he felt the same way. I can go for the kill here. He does drop the Spire, but he's got to be careful because if Petraeus, I think Petraeus still has an Overseer on the other side of the map. If Petraeus scouts this, don't forget Petraeus has Roach Meat. If he then goes for it, I mean, he's down a couple drones as well, though, so I guess Snoot can also just make roaches. Yeah, towards the end of the attack, after the last wall of Zergling, Snoot just, uh, you know, uh, got those 10 more drones to secure that in common advantage that we can see on the screen right there. Snoot mining a tiny bit more than his opponent, 300 minerals a minute, a little bit of gas too, so actually makes a difference. And Snoot, like, <laughs> when you think about how good that attack went, oh, he's, he's, he's actually going to go for the third hatch. He's got that main issue with, this is in the red, I want to take it out so bad, but there's already a a lot of defense there, so he doesn't want to overcommit to this. Yep. But uh, as I was saying, um, considering uh, the position, we liked Petraeus' position before the, the, the beginning of the fight, right. but the, the tactical decision with the wraparound from the Zerglings actually worked so well. And even that, Petraeus is still in this game. He's probably a little bit behind. Like, I actually for think sure. he's quite a bit behind right now. Mm -hmm. As uh, Kaf the Observer is showing us that he has never scouted the Spire. Oh, so yeah. he doesn't know. And uh, he doesn't have any sort of anti air. There's not a single Spore Crawler on the map. No Hydralis then. I mean, yeah, there are a couple of Queens, but. Uh, queens against seven, eight, nine middleists, it's going to be very hard. And don't forget that this hatchery is very low on HP. I mean, the roaches may keep it safe against a couple zerglings, but the one queen is not going to keep it safe against seven or eight middleists. Yeah. And then even though Petraeus will have plus two missile attacks, He's just not going to be able to do a whole lot with it. It's a shame he never yeah. uh, never scouted it with the Overseer. Because if he does scout it and has like spores every single base, he's got 56 drones. Like he could he could afford like two spores each uh, each base. And with the timing, with the plus two attack that he has, wow. yeah, gonna go for the counter attack. That's something that he needs to go for. Hydra then, and some spores are gonna go into the production tab. But those mule is actually gonna deal a little bit of damage. Yeah, uh, the cool thing now though is that Petraeus should have more army supply on the oh, ground, yeah. and he does have plus one missile attacks already with plus two almost. Finished. Finishing up, so how much is Petraeus able to get done here on oh. the other side of the map? And no road speed for Snoot either, so this fight is not actually doing so well. Uh, uh, Snoot, that is, is actually getting all those ah, roaches the demolished, but the Mules are coming back. He needs to split a lot of roaches in every single base and try to get some drones. And that's actually what he's trying to do. Petraeus with the three roaches on the left side, maybe going to try to take out the Atreus, but the Mules is just taking down every single unit. Ah, Petraeus is able to get, let's say, like 15 drones over here. It's going to be hard, but yeah. uh, he's already getting getting quite a few here. Eight drones fall. He should be able to get a few more. He's buying time for Hydralisk on the other side of the map. He's buying time for these Spore Crawlers. Oh, I never saw that Stalker hologram on the right side of Echo. I always knew this was a Protoss map. Yeah, right there. Uh, yeah. I've never seen that. Oh, it's a Zealot as well. now. Sick. All right. Yeah, it does look like a Protoss map for sure. But see, like, once again, Mutal is getting a lot of damage done, but the counter attack was decent. And when you look at the supply, there's a Hydralis coming in. So with the plus two attack, it makes such a difference. Look yeah. at those roaches. They are melting to the groove spines of the Hydralis. Yeah, Petraeus putting up one hell of a fight yeah. over here against Snoot. I mean, Snoot was obviously a clear favorite going into this series. Uh, can Petraeus cause the first upset? Starcraft 2 Nation War Season 4 and take a 3 2 lead over Norway. Ooh, Lurkus. Okay. I do like Lurkus, but I believe that Petraeus has a couple of Ravages as well. At least he has a lot of Roaches. And, like, Lurkus are fantastic, but I also think if you're like pretty far behind, if it's 3 base against 4, mm -hmm. then with a couple of Ravages, if you force cross the balls, I think it is doable. Uh, we saw a couple of great, uh, you know, Lurker War CBC and the Global Finals as well. We saw Solar use Lurkus very well. So he lays and use them a couple of times. I think that's a good uh, that's a good answer from uh, from Snoot to go into uh, that uh, high tech uh, composition to fight off against those roaches and hydralisk. The muscular augments are gonna finish right now, so those hydralisk are gonna be a little bit easier to control to get out all those muscularisk. He needs to be super. Uh, super cautious on this one because those hydrolysis will melt the mutas. Yeah, I would have loved to see actually uh, leave, uh, see Petraeus leave a couple of mutas over here on the left bottom because then I think he would have cornered those mutalisk and he would have been able to pick off the majority of them. But, but it's still alright. Now, Petraeus is getting a Baneling nest finally. Uh, probably wants to get Baneling speed as well. 
which can be great if you can connect with the Hydras, but it's not very great against Lurkers. And once again, I feel this is the second time in this game that Petraeus is going to be surprised by the tech choice of Snoot, because mm -hmm. I don't think he has any idea that Snoot is this close to Lurkers. Yeah, actually closer than ever, because the Lurker then just finished, so he's going to be able to produce the first ones. But can he make a difference with a lot of Hydralisk and a plus two attack? Yeah, there's too many Ravagers, I think, here. And he's going to be able to gain so much time, because you need to take those battles into account. You don't want to hit them in the face because that's not going to go well for you. Even though he has an opportunity to deal some damage right now, he needs to go back. Yeah, that's very well done by Snoot, yeah. right? Just realizing which units he needs to survive just a little bit longer, <laughs> dropping those Karasa balls and buying time for those Lurkers. Some high level play there by our Norwegian Zerg, as he still has a couple of meters being annoying as well. Of course, the big problem for Snoot is that it is three bases against four. Mm -hmm. uh, Petraeus can do the exact same thing, which is what he's doing. He's starting his own Lurker then as well. Upgrade-wise, he has a massive advantage. Plus two missile attacks and plus one carapace. Yes, he's down. Eight, nine, army strike. Did, now things are getting very oh. weird. As Snoot is actually out in the middle of the map and Petraeus is going to try to flank this army. And he doesn't have any detection right there, so he needs to go back at the instant those, uh, those Lurkers burrow. And uh, good play at the moment. Okay, he's going to uh, now uh, figure Ooh. out that he needs them. Oh, is it going to go into a base trade situation? It looks like it. No! Snoot doesn't believe that he wants this to happen, so, he, he, so he's going back at the moment. But the cooling tower has been taken down, gaining a lot of time for Snoot to come back and put those, those lockers in place. Okay. Yeah, but I actually like this for Petraeus, because Petraeus is still up on four bases, and yeah. now Petraeus bought the time for his own lurker then to finish up. Uh, he left a little bit of free supply as well. He panicked for a split second, where he made like 14 <laughs> roaches, but he did leave 8-9 supply free. He can always sacrifice a couple of roaches, get a few more lurkers. This could be a great position, though, for Snoot, as once again, Snoot realized that this could very well be his moment. Oh man, this game is getting wild. Oh, this game is actually getting wild. Can he go? He's gonna go down the ramp against six lurkers. Oh. Is it the real, the, the, the good situation? Okay, there's no roaches to cover for them. So one lurker go, uh, goes down, but a lot of damage has already been dealt. He's getting four lurkers himself as well. Trace has a lot of money, would well, love to see him spend it. I mean, okay. I, he's, okay. this is just getting very weird. We'll yeah. see a lurker flank or something. There are a couple of lurkers there as well, keeping this third base safe. That hatchery has been super low on HP, by the way, for the majority of this game. And it's still alive. The natural, however, may not be alive anymore. But let's see what Petraeus is able to do with his counterattack on the other side of the move. But Snoot has lurkers here as well. Yeah, three lurkers. No, oh, Petraeus, Petraeus used lurkers. Got about five lurkers in the middle no. of the night. He needs to burrow them. No. Petraeus! Oh, this is terrible for him. This is so terrible because that that oh uh, that army uh, movement oh could God. have been taken out by the five lurkers that uh, Snoot didn't anticipate. Instead of that, those five lurkers just died for nothing, and he lost his entire natural, losing the hatchery, but lo not losing that many drones. To be honest, oh, this army is a little bit trapped now. Yes. So he's going to be very careful. Good movement on these roaches on the south side there by Snoot. I love it, forcing this army to be trapped. It cannot leave, and most of these units are pretty much every single unit will fall. Ah, uh, Snoot just turned this game around, despite the fact that he was down in upgrades. Uh, things were really not looking all that good for him anymore. I mean, yes, he had the Lurker advantage, but he needed to make something happen because he was down in upgrades, was down a base for quite some time. Just sick army movement by Snoot. Oh, the life! Oh, losing three Lurkers to just take out two. And uh, as we mentioned, Lurkers are pivotal in this game, but... It looks like Snoot has just done it. He's gonna go for the fourth base, getting all the lava and the drones. GG is called out, and Snoot uh, actually puts uh, Norway in a good position right there with a 3 2 lead, but that was such a tough game. Yeah, that was really close. That was a lot closer than I even thought it was going to be. Just right off the get go, I think Petraeus played very solid mm. early on, didn't take any damage of those links and banes. Uh, you know, he skipped link speed, skipped the baneling nest, but he was able to, sec going up to three bases, relatively secure. Um, you know, it was low in HP, then Snoot made that big hatchery tech timed attack and it felt like Snoot could have easily taken out that hatch and for a split second it even potentially looked like Snoot could have sealed the deal because he had so many more links coming in mm -hmm. but Petraeus was able to defend and after that with plus one missile attacks the game just got wild, right? Like, he scouted the Muta tech a little bit too late, but the very first time the Mutas came out, they flew right across the map while the units of Petraeus went through the middle, mm -hmm. so the Mutas didn't see it, and then they had to turn around again, and from that point on, it was just ZVZ madness. A very entertaining game, yeah, though. A really entertaining game, considering uh, Petraeus is playing a little bit of an old-school style, I would mm -hmm. say. Like, you can, you, you can tell that he hasn't been as active as he was before, because going for that fast layer, skipping Zergling speed, is something that really, uh, like, brings memories 
is back from Heart of the Swarm, right? Uh, in Legacy of the Void, every single Zerg will tell you, you can do like 15 minutes of a ZVZ without even going to Lair. You will go for Roach, you will go for Ravage Earth. We will know who, yeah. uh, who's going to be, yeah, the revive, and it's going to be Petraeus, obviously. They're going to revive, uh, revive the, the Zerg player. And they actually had like a really solid game the, between the two of them, so... No question on my side, like, okay, no, just go it makes bring, a lot of bring sense. in Petraeus, man. Yep. Uh, I mean, Crimson had a fun game against Scythe, but it wasn't enough. We saw Mighty Kiwi, you know, take out the Terran in, mm -hmm. in excellent fashion and perhaps get a little bit unlucky against our Norwegian Protoss, but it just makes sense here that the most established, the most well-known, and the most successful player from New Zealand is going to be revived, which obviously is... Petraeus. Yeah, and it's going to be on Habitation Station, a map where you could argue that you could go for the same kind of style with mm -hmm. skipping the, the speedling uh, because you can get uh, a wall uh, set up uh, quite fast on the natural considering the hatchery and the ramp are not that far away. So uh, we'll see if uh, Petraeus de decides to go for it. But uh, once again, the way Snoot handled the first attack actually like changed everything yeah, yeah, yeah. for me because... It Petraeus looked like had Petraeus everything could hold. to defend. He had the road speed. He was about to finish plus one. He had those Unix coming in. Mm -hmm. I do think there's one thing that he could have done, yeah. and that's knock down the cooling tower. I think his life would have been a lot easier if he would have knocked down the tower. Yeah. You force Snoot to either kill the tower, which means extra time, which means extra roaches for you, which means more defender's advantage, and you can reposition the spine. Or you would have forced Snoot to attack into the spine, which means that you force the cross of balls maybe to go on the spine, and it's going to be a little more tricky for these links to just run in there and get yeah. the wraparound. I mean, you got to give credit to Snoot as well for just his perfect execution. And you seizing know. the opportunity. Yeah, exactly. Oh, he sees it and down? he jumps on it. I'm going to yeah. go to the third base and I'm going to have that better position over you because I'm going to have the ramp advantage and probably get down the, the, the third archery that you want to defend so bad. So just Snoot making, uh, you know, making uh, great stuff happening with a pretty decent situation for the defenders uh, in Petraeus in this case. So All just right. a great play. And as we mentioned, that was like one of our longest game here in the ZVZ uh, matchup. We, can, uh, we, could, we could get something even more crazy uh, going on to uh, Habitation Station. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Or Snoot is just going to close it out here for the first of six best of sevens that you guys will see today on the mainstream here at the StarCraft 2 Nation Wars Season 4 brought to you by O-Gaming and Blizzard. Funka. Let's do it. In the top right of Habitation Station, in the red, is our Zerg player from New Zealand, Petraeus. And in the top left, for Norway, he is their best player. He is one of the greatest foreigners of 2016. He is Snoot. You know, even though I stand by everything I said about Snoot's 2016 and it mm -hmm. being a good year, I do know that there are a couple of diehard fans out there as well that would be like, how can you say that? <laughs> you know, Season 2, he lost to Guru in the round of 32. Season 3, I forgot who Snoot lost to in, in Montreal, but I know it was a relatively early exodus. Did he lose to Tru? No, he didn't lose to Tru. I forgot who Snoot lost to uh, in Season 3. Obviously, or I want to say Marine Lord, but I'm... Probably Montreal. I don't think he lost to Marina. I know it no, was no, no, a, no. a relatively no. surprising defeat again, but I mean, you gotta look past the big WCS events. Obviously, those were events where Snoot would have loved to do better. Yeah. Katowice was great, made it to the final. Absolutely, you know, nothing wrong with that performance. It was a against. great start of the year. Yep. Uh, and especially in ZVZ, you remember uh, his series against, I think it was Hydra back then? Yeah, that was, was oh, that game on that, on that green map. I forgot the, ma <laughs> the, 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 the massive four player map. I yeah. forgot the name of it, but. Uh, that was a fantastic game. One of my favorite ZVZs of the year. Very close, very tense. But no, yeah, I still stand with the statement that I think like when it comes to the other events, the events that Snoop participated in in China, and obviously WCS Copa, which I think was his best performance of the year, mm -hmm. I still think that Snoot can be very satisfied, very pleased with 2016. And hopefully next year he can peak on a few of the bigger moments, but I think overall it's still been a solid year for him. Hopefully he can put Norway on his back here. I mean, we saw a couple of the memes already. We love memes here, guys, at Nation Wars Season 4. So send them in, hashtag NW4. I saw somebody made a little picture of, you know, basically, um, how would you explain it? Like Basically Snoot standing on the top of an ice mountain, carrying the rest of his team on his back. Like, uh, it was cool. <laughs> I like that image. All right. Fast third hatchery from Petraeus. With, uh, sorry, from uh, Snoot, uh, whereas Petraeus is going for a speed and a bailing nest, but also gonna go for a third archery, but he's gonna go for the gold. 
Trace likes his money. <laughs> well, Kai, you know what they say. Money's money is money. <laughs> I agree totally with that statement. Snoot is actually going to scout it fairly soon, fairly fast, I would say. With that overload, yeah, yeah, he's going to turn it a little bit. And uh, yeah, he wants to know if that third archer is going down. And indeed, it is. Good micro here. Fun Petra is getting a Zergling for free. And he's going to have the Metabolic Boost uh, finishing in six seconds. Maybe going to be able to, uh, to scout a little bit. But two Banelings at the same time. Where are they morphed? Uh, Two banelings, are uh, those defensive banelings? Yeah, pretty much between the, the natural and the third base. So defensive banelings right there. I'm not really sure that either of those players are going to try to attack. I think they're going to accept the macro situation. Yeah, I think it's hard to attack here. I mean, I mean, with the gold, of course, you could say that there is an opening maybe for Petraeus if he saturates the gold and from that point on just floods forever. But it's very hard, it's very risky, and Petraeus also knows that if it doesn't work from that point on, it doesn't really matter if he has the gold or not. If Snoot is able to get a whole bunch of roaches out, defend. I mean, Habitation Station is one of the shortest maps out there. Counterattacks are super deadly, uh-oh. Petraeus managed to sneak in two Zerglings that were scouted earlier by our Queen, but he, re he uh, relocated them. At the same time, the pressure is coming in from Snoot with a lot of Zerglings coming to that gold and the Zerglings, those extra Zerglings from oh, Petraeus are a little bit too late to the party. No! The bump! The GG! I mean, he had roaches on the way, but he lost his own defensive banes, maybe too distracted by his own plans to attack and... Yeah, that gold being as exposed as it is, if those, you know, 8, 9, 10 drones fall, it's going to be very hard from that point on. And maybe it would have even been very hard to save the hatchery. Yeah, yeah, I know. Oh. It was, like, I would still say a pretty early GG, like he didn't fight it that much. But that's the thing, like, he, uh, he tried to took an advantage in yeah. terms of economy by taking that gold. Probably didn't produce the units at the right uh, at the right moment. It was just getting cut off by just a tiny bit of zerglings. Right. There weren't that much. Like he produced 12, I think, and four banes, which is not that much to be honest. Yeah, I mean Petraeus left those two defensive banes behind, but we saw them blow up. We mm -hmm. didn't know what they blow up on, but it obviously wasn't that much. As Snoot still had so much left, and then the roaches were on the way. Those roaches would have been too late. I think this is one of these moments where it looks like an early GG, but I think uh, that's a GG that we can justify. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, which means that the higher seed nation, Norway, does advance to StarCraft II Nation War Season 4 after taking out New Zealand 4-2. to two. But I don't think it was as easy or as lopsided as a lot of people thought this match was going to be. I think it was awesome to see Petraeus play a couple matches again. Yeah. And I definitely think that Petraeus will uh, maybe perhaps take a look at that replay of the game on Echo because there was a very realistic chance for the oh, Kiwis. Yeah to uh, secure a 3-2 advantage at that point. Uh, it's good to see Sight and Evire uh, uh, getting those wins like mm -hmm. coming in. That's uh, also uh, pretty, uh, uh, pretty cool to, uh, to see when you consider that now Norway is going to have to play in the group stage and those guys will have to help Snood in his, uh, in his journey of uh, putting Norway on the map again. Mm -hmm. And uh, in terms of uh, what we anticipated, Snood comes in, gets the win, gets the, you know, the actual win for his team, just doing you know, exactly what we uh, anticipated from him. So, uh, you know, great, uh, great job by Snood, great job by Norway, and mm -hmm. they are uh, qualified in the group stage of National Warfare. Yeah, I think it's safe to say that this match will last a little bit longer than a lot of us thought, so we're not going to keep it too much longer. We're going to head over to a break soon. But after this, it's time for South Korea, which I know a lot of people are very excited for. Oh, I think yeah. this South Korean team is, is pretty godlike. I mean, Zess, Innovation, Dion. Dion. Yeah, I mean, yeah, well... C ah. Could it get a little bit better than that, please? No, I don't know. Like innovation, considering how well it Man. did in Gyeonggi. Like it's it, you. You can tell it's a call I on who he used to be, but also at the same time, a week ago, he just you know destroyed everybody in Gyeonggi. And uh, now you've got Bjorn, who's arguably the best player in the world right mm -hmm. now, and Zest, who's also a guy that you don't want to mess with, yeah. considering the beginning of his 2016 year. The guy is just unbeatable. That's going it's to be a scary a, team. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun to see South Korea go up against Croatia. Well, that's going to be our next match. We're going to head over to a very small break. And after that, we'll be back with much more StarCraft 2 Nation Wars 4 qualifiers action.